Bom dia para você que é de bom dia, boa noite para você que é da boa noite, boa tarde, se você acabou de conectar aí no YouTube e tá para assistir mais um bate-papo Mayhem. E hoje a gente vai trazer um cara lá da África do Sul, na verdade ele é inglês, e o cara manja mais magia do que eu, você e todo mundo aqui somados, que na década de 70 ele já estava fazendo o Abramelin. Então só para a gente ter uma noção, é uma honra absurda para mim. É, antes da gente começar, você precisa apertar aqui em legendas, e depois você vai do lado e coloca configurar, Translate to português. E aí você vai conseguir entender o que ele fala se você não fala inglês. Well, tonight I will be interviewing Lionel Schnell or Ramsey Dukes or he has about 20 names, I don't know. He has played everything and he has been around since the 60s. So I am nervous, I'm really, really nervous and I prepared some questions here and we have to talk about for an hour or a bit more. So, Lionel, how are you? Very well, thanks, and very honored to be with you. How's the pandemic down there? Oh, it's, um, it's pretty grim. We did quite well to start with, but now we've got the second wave, and it's, it's hitting Cape Town particularly badly, because Cape Town is a, is a very pleasure-loving um, sort of res, uh, tourist city. Uh, where people love things like that, and so we're suffering. Oh, well, the, the first question I always ask is how, what makes a normal person wakes up one day and then 50 years later you have pre performed the Abramelin ritual, write the Satanist diary, you publish several books about chaos, magic, philosophy, virtual reality, and You are also associated with the OTO and IoT. And how, how's that journey? I, I would sort of outline my life story and where these things came in. And then we could talk about the magic in particular more later. Um, I was brought up in the deep countryside in England, you know, not another house in sight. Uh, we didn't have electricity and our water came from a spring. So I was brought up very much in nature um, and uh, I had a brother and a sister, but they were quite a bit older than me. So I spent a lot of time thinking on my own. My parents weren't particularly spiritual or religious, but they had met in an organization called the Kibbo Kift, which was a woodcraft movement, which meant they were very much into um, uh, learning through nature, living with nature, rather like you know the, the green ideas of, of nowadays. So I was used as a child to people having totem names, names like uh, my father was Phoenix, the firebird, because he was the one who could light fires. My mother was Akusha, the Celtic dove of peace. And we knew people with names like crow and beaver and animal names like that. So that was not quite a normal um, uh, childhood. So what took me out of that was that um, I went to the local village school, which was, you know, about a mile's walk up, up the roads. And uh, the teacher there, all my parents, they thought I was very bright and I ought to try for a scholarship. And so at the age of 11 or so, I was taken into um, Bristol to a, a, a public school, what we call a public school, which actually is English for a private school. Um, and um, I got a scholarship, but uh, it was oh, my father couldn't really afford to send me there until the government, which was a socialist government at the time, decided to fund bright children to go to these private schools, these special schools. And so I went there as a, um, uh, to a school in Bristol. And as a frightened country mouse finding myself in the city, it was all rather sort of scary and awesome. But um, I survived. And uh, my best Latin, English, and maths. But the maths was very well taught, and my housemaster was a mathematician. And so he persuaded me that's what I should study to get into university. And then I got a scholarship to Cambridge from there. And um, my subject was pure maths. So, what about magic? Well, the thing is that um, 
you know, some people say, when did you start having an interest in magic? Well, I would say that I always had, I mean, I think little children are nearly always interested in magic. But what happens is as you grow up, you're told it's silly and it's not grown up to believe in magic. Now, um, of course, that was said to me when I got to this public school and was um, proper teachers and everything, I was told that magic is nothing, it doesn't exist. But I didn't that because I thought, well, why is then so much said about it? You know, the books, famous people in the past were interested in it and the books were written about it. If it's nothing, why hasn't it just vanished? And the answer to that was always on the lines of, well, it was a primitive way of looking at the world. For backward people who haven't had an education and they, they, they don't know any better. And so our earliest ancestors used to do sort of silly things like, um, you know, if they wanted to catch a deer, they might put deer's horns on their heads and dress up in deer skins and, and, and make noises like deers and dance and paint deers on the wall of caves, you know, a lot of silly things, but that was how they thought and they thought it would attract the deer. Now, the, th the theory sort of extended from that. Um, if you keep doing for thousands of years, you keep doing these silly things, some people begin to do them very well. And that's what art is. If you do silly things really well, you're an artist um, and we recognize what that is. And the theory extended for silly things really well. Some people actually create things which are sacred. It might be a book, um, it, you know, it might be a theory like Marxism, it might be um, a work of art or it might be a flag or a symbol like the cross. It becomes so sacred that everyone recognizes it and it, you have real authority and that is what religion is. Doing silly things with authority is what we call religion. And we know this is true because now we have science which explains all this. And so you know, that puts it all in the past. That was the sort of um, way it was explained to me. But um, so I was still interested, but a little frustrated. So what could I do to find out about magic? Well, about the only thing was psychical research, you know, trying to telepathy experiments and reading about psychical researchers. But they tended to be rather disappointing because very often it turns out it was a fraud or, or fake or wasn't significant. So. I was struggling a bit until I came across the book of the sacred magic of Abramelin the Mage. This had just been republished by Watkins and I read a review of it which said this is the real magic. And so uh, as a schoolboy of about 11 I ordered it from the public library and they got me a copy which is pretty impressive because it was a limited edition, I think 500 copies or something, but they bought it and so I took it to school and read it and read it. And of course, as an enthusiastic kid, I'm gonna do this when I grow up because it says you have to be, I think 25 to 50 to do it, you see. So um, that was what I vowed. Uh, of course, when I grew up, I was too busy doing other things. But the other thing was in, my, in the upper school, when I started to do science, there was a science library right up at the top of the building you come across this room with beautiful creaking wooden floors and there was one whole wall was a glass cabinet full of books on magic and alchemy. Um, now, what are they doing in a science library? The thing was that um, uh, some years ago of science was a man called Holmyard who studied these things and he actually wrote the history of alchemy for the penguin books. And that was his collection. And there were these wonderful, you know, by Paracelsus, um, Agrippa, all these great names from the past. And I could take these books home with me in the holidays and read them and everything. And that was absolutely fascinating. It was a real sort of Harry Potter moment finding these, um, you know, this library of old leather bound books and, and even um, uh, manuscripts in Greek uh, and no, in, in um, Arabic of alchemy, things like that going right back. So that sort of um, whetted my appetite and, and kept me interested. Then of course, when I got to Cambridge, in the Cambridge Library, there was a very big collection of Crowley books. And there were interesting letters between Crowley and the librarian, because of course Crowley went to Cambridge 
And the librarian was at that time was always trying to have every book. That was the objective of these university libraries, to have every book that was published. And so you had these interesting let letters between the librarian saying, I want a copy of this. And Crowley sort of writing back and saying, why don't people buy my new stuff? They always want the old stuff and things like that, you know. So these interesting letters. But anyway, I, that's where I read up Crowley and I was very impressed. I liked his thinking. And um, so we can come back to that later, what was so good about it. In the library, I also came across a magazine called New Dimensions. Now, this I discovered was published not far from where I lived in the holidays in Gloucestershire. And I went along and it was a place called Helios Books. It was a, a secondhand occult book service, you know, that sold books by mail order around the world. And it had a fantastic lot of stuff there. And so I got picked up much more of occult information there. And the man in charge introduced me to Gerald York. Now he was um, one of Crowley's important disciples, a guy who actually, um, financed 777 books uh, the book of correspondences which Crowley published and um, he had made a magical vow that he would collect all of Crowley's works and so he had this fantastic um, collection you know not just books but manuscripts and everything of Crowley's stuff which later went to the Warburg Institute where it still is there including you know the original paintings of Frieda, Frieda Harris of the tarot decks and things like that and um, one, ex one example of his collecting, one time I went to visit him and I looked at it in a bookshop in the local town of Tewkesbury and I found an old battered copy of Crowley's collected poems and there was a handwritten poem in, in the front of it and I showed it to him when I arrived and he said that's an original unpublished Crowley poem and so he photographed it and, and put it into the collection you see so you know, he's still keeping to his vow and um so uh, the other thing that he showed me was um, I had just heard about Austin Spare and there was nothing available about Austin Spare, but I just heard him mentioned. So I asked him and he had a complete collection of Austin Spare. But he said, a short while ago, I gave it to a man called Kenneth Grant um, because he wanted to write something about it, but he hasn't done anything yet. And the only book he had left was the Book of Pleasure which um, he lent me and I found it was fascinating. And actually it start, I started collecting all the Austin Spare books I could, um, which were very, very few and far between. And I wrote a thing um, called Spare Parts, an essay describing the Book of Pleasure and its theories, which uh, later became an influence on the chaos magic current. So that was um, sort of what kept my interest going. Um, after university, I became a teacher, teacher. I became a civil servant. I was a, I was a stressman, an aircraft stressman. Really, I was drifting. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was, you know, trying different things. And it wasn't until uh, the 80s that I became a freelance technical writer, which is what I remained. Meanwhile, um, in the mid 70s, I met Christopher McIntosh, who is now known as a um, historian of the esoteric and masonry and things like that. And he wanted to produce a book, which was a series of essays on topics which were becoming interesting in the you know, 60s, things like yoga, meditation, things like that. And he said it would be interesting to include in that collection an article about Western magic, because it was sort of people didn't know about it and it would be interesting. And he asked me to write an essay, which I did. I wrote an essay on magic, um, but the book never happened. And so I was left with this essay and I thought, well, it's a shame to waste it. I'll expand it a bit and make it into a book. And that was SSOTBME, an essay on magic, the first book that I published. End of the 70s, I did the Abramlin operation. And meanwhile, I was hearing about this chaos current, chaos magic, which was created by Pete Carroll and Ray Sherwin and a group of magicians up in the north of England and um, became very influential. And I realized that my works had sort of fed into that current. And so it was very much in my spirit. 
I became a member of a ritual group called Free Spirit, where we party was founded by Gerald Suster, who wanted a sort of more academic discussion group um, to get to sort of high level magic. And he got in a lot of people who'd written books, who were really academic students of, or you know, academic experts on magic. And they included people who'd written books, Alec Howe, um, Gerald Suster, Nicholas Goodrick Clark, um, who later became taught esotericism at, at Exeter University, Bob Gilbert, who was an antiquarian who'd writ written books about, and um, Francis King, who was famous for magic, uh, sexuality, magic and perversion, and other books on magic, and Tanya Lerman, an American academic, an anthropologist who'd come to England in order to study magical groups. And she wrote her thesis as, in a book called Persuasions of the Witch's Craft, which is quite a respected book. So people like that were there and, and I was a member of that. So that's the sort of, um, oh yes, and from that time I became, eventually stopped at drifting and I became a freelance technical writer. So that is really my response to your first of my life and how magic was a, a thread that ran through it. You were a mathematic, so how did this oh, mathematical mind saw the Kelf's magic theory? And what was magic to you back then? Right, well, mathematics was my main subject at school, but we had to do some physics, you know, as part of it. You had physics, maths, and higher maths. And I saw physics, science, as very much about saying no. Um, rather like religion and science, they say no. Religion tells you what you, you know, thou shalt not do this, that, and the other. And science also is a bit like that. Because if you um, decided, you know, science is about experimentation. So if you decided, you said to your science tutor, let's um, do an experiment to see if praying to angels helps cops go. He would say, no, that's ridiculous. Angels don't exist. You know, if you said, let's look at the sign of the zodiac and how it affects something, they say, no, no, that's nonsense. You know, astrology is nonsense. No, don't do that experiment. Now, maths actually is very different. One day, our maths class, a, a teacher came in and wrote on the board, let I be such that I squared equals minus one. And he had a rebellion on his hands. Because we'd had this scientific training, we said, but that's, there's no such thing. You can't have a square root of a negative number. It doesn't exist. And he said, well, think of it as another dimension. Well, where is this other dimension? Show us. You know, uh, we, we protested, we protested. And he said, the trouble is you've had too much science. And eventually he quieted us down and he said, okay, call it an imaginary number. So let's see how it works. And so he did the algebra of imaginary numbers and it worked. Okay, it worked as a piece of maths, so what? But the thing is, it act, not only did it work, but it actually cast a lot of light on our real world. You know, electricity theory is based on it. Most modern science depends heavily on imaginary numbers. So to the mathematical mind, the fact that it didn't exist didn't matter. You see if it works. And really that's the same approach in um, magic. You know, um, going back to the idea, uh, if we pray to the angels, will it make our crops better? Well, so what if they don't exist? Let's try it. Let's see what happens if we pray to the angels. Well, we might get good results. You see, it's, um, it's a different mindset, a much more liberated one to me. So um, these ideas, they could be just imagination, but they can have real results. And that's quite a subversive thing. And um, uh, this maths worked like that in the past because so there's this idea of things have to be real to study them. And math says, no, they don't. Imaginary things can be just as effective. Now, back in classical era, um, they were very scientific. There was what they call the axial age, you know, of um, Confucius and um, Buddha and um, uh, Socrates, all very anti-magic, 
empty religion, very sort of rational thinkers. And this tradition of rationalism became very strong in Greece in particular. And there's this idea of everything is made of atoms. They believed in this atomic structure. But the mathematicians put this problem to them. They said, if you made a square, let's say it's a billion atoms that way, a billion atoms that way, how many atoms would lie across the diagonal? And you can show mathematically that you can't make that diagonal out of, math out of atoms. There'll always be something left over, however small your atoms are. That there are numbers which are not rational and they called them irrational numbers. Now that's a big blow to people who are defending a rational universe. And it's a bit tough, you've got to include a bit of irrationality. Well, the mathematician showed it isn't like that. That actually so most numbers are irrational. That instead of being, you know, a rational world with a little bit of unreason in it, we're like a great ocean of irrationality. And the rational world is just like a little leaf floating on it. Um, and again, that was a blur sort of rational thinking of classical times. In centuries later, the Roman era was a rebirth of magical thinking. You had um, uh, alchemy um, grew then and astrology. A lot of the magical thinking of today actually followed on this period of five centuries of rational thinking. And alchemy was an interesting example because they say we've had these books on alchemy in my school because people think we used to say that al alchemy was a primitive thing out of which chemistry grew. But actually in the history of alchemy, it was the other way around. The Greeks and the Arabs had a very sophisticated metallurgy, which we would say was scientific. They made observations, they measured the quantities and they could make different metals and different alloys. But it became so important because of um, coinage, you know, kings wanting to make coins, that they, they locked up the, the, the um, chemists. They wouldn't let them communicate in case the secrets got out. Now, if you do that to science, it has a bad effect. It became more and more mystical and secretive, and it grew into alchemy. And similar things happened in, in, um, in China, you know, the, the metallurgy of the time became Taoist alchemy. And the interesting thing to me was that um, this was in the 80s, uh, we noticed something similar happening in the West. You know, in Germany, where they'd thrown out the Jewish scientists and became a separate scientific, it became weird. They began to sort of study the hollow earth and fire and ice and all sorts of things. And the same thing happened in the 80s in the Cold War. We were always hearing about mysterious discoveries being made in, behind the Iron Curtain. Um, and uh, the CIA began to experiment, you know, men who stare at goats, they began to do psychic experiments. And so I said, well, that's what happens. You know, if, if you don't, if science gets locked up, and it's contained, it, it becomes, begins to be magical. And so, yeah, that was, um, that was the way that mathematics and, and magical thinking could be quite subversive. So when I wrote this book, SSOT BME, that was the sort of thing I wrote about, the way that different ways of looking at the world can actually profoundly change it. Um, and I call them different orientations because at the time when I was at school, there was a guy called C.P. Snow who wrote about what he called two cultures. There was this big division um, in academia in the 50s science was up and coming, it was the new thing. And it was being taught more and more in universities. And some of the scientists were getting very arrogant. They say, why do we still go on teaching these things like, you know, the classics and history and all that? Um, we should be only teaching science because that's the way forward. Uh, we don't need these old fusty old things. And the humanists were answered back saying, these scientists have got no culture. They're, they're uncouth, you know, we need, the old teaching. And this was beginning to be a split. He said, where should the finance go? And what C.P. Snow said is actually there's different ways of looking at the world. And they're not, um, they, they're not really in conflict, they really complement each other. And 
that worked very well because people realize you can be the world's best scientist. It doesn't stop you going to an opera and having a thoroughly emotional experience. In fact, it's probably good for you. You know, you just know to keep the two things separate. And I thought that was very interesting. And I said, well, what about religious thinking? That's another culture, which no one had mentioned at the time. And then I realized there's another way of looking at the world, which I called magical. So I saw actually there are four different ways of looking at the world. Now, when people hear that, they tend to say, well, how do you define magic? What makes it? Now, one of the things of magical thinking is it doesn't need definitions. It's more about directions. And that is a bit that is strange because religion and science on the whole, like clear boundaries. If you say to a religious person, you know, are you Protestant or are you Catholic? You don't expect them to say both. You know, it's one or the other. Muslim or Christian, it's one or the other. They don't say both. And in science, things need to be well-defined, clear boundaries, otherwise they're not meaningful. But in magic, uh, and art is different. Art is more like magic. I know there are many distinctions in art, you know, surrealism, postmodernism, all that sort of thing. But artists on the whole, they like to break those boundaries. You know, boundaries are there to be jumped over. You know, I, I prefer to call myself um, a free thinker, not a surrealist or whatever, you know. Um, and in magic, uh, all the classifications overlap. And that sounds weird. But if you think of it, um, the tree of life, they say every sphere of the tree of life contains the entire tree of life. And in a sign, um, in a sense, begins with Aries and works through the 12 signs within the sign. It's the way mag magical systems are fractal like that. Now, people, rationalists will say, well, you can't work with a thing like that. That's ridiculous. If everything is enclosed in everything else, you can't think like that. And I say, yes, you can because we do that when we think in directions. Now, Cape Town is a very southern town and Oslo is a very northern town. But actually in Cape Town, there's just as much north as there is in Oslo and just as much south. We have a northern suburbs and, and so on. And it's because it's about a direction, not a definition. And I said, that is how um, these cultures are like that. So, for instance, um, science, strictly, the method of science is you do tests, you make observations in order to test if one of several theories, whether it is true or not. And you can show if it doesn't work, then it's probably is inaccurate or false and you can get rid of it. That is strict science. But science is actually done in... Um, some people like um, uh, Richard Hawkins, no, what's it, um, Stephen Hawkins, he looked at the field of science, which had many conflicting ideas like um, uh, uh, gravity, Einstein's ideas, and quantum physics, which conflicted with each other. And it was a bit messy. So he was looking for one beautiful theory which would link them all up and connect them and make sense of it. So he was really working like a, uh, an artist, a sculptor, who's got a block of granite and is chipping it away, trying to find the ideal beautiful shape in the middle of it. So you can be doing science, but you can do it in a very artistic way. And then there's um, Richard Dawkins, who he's a scientist, but he's trying to show people the truth He's, a, he's a, um, a crusader for the truth. He wants to banish the heretics who talk about magic and religion and all this nonsense. Um, he's really approaching science as a, a religious spirit. He's like a preacher telling people, this is what you should believe in. The rest is, is wrong. And then there's a lot of people, there's a lot of magic in science too. Because if you think of the, um, a very, bad example of magical thinking is the gambler. You know, someone who um, loses every time, but 
this is the day when he's going to win. He he's so sure of himself and he's sure he's connected to the universe today. This is the day he's going to go and win and he goes and loses. But that thinking which people laugh at, if you think um, science can be very boring. So why would someone at the start of their life when they got the whole life in front of them go to the deep country and study one butterfly for a whole year, just studying the habits of that butterfly. It's because of the same sort of thinking. They have a feeling that there's something out there they can discover, that they've got the mind that's going to do that. They feel it's calling them. Um, belief that maybe out of it will come a paper which will be accepted by nature and will win them a good name. And maybe they'll hit the jackpot and might someday they might have a Nobel Prize for their work. It's magical thinking. So within science, you see all these other impulses are there and they're all part of what is practical science. Um, so in that way, these things, they all overlap. They're there all the time, but you could see their different directions, different ways of looking. And that's me. Well, I saw these four cultures. And instead of um, defining them, I tried to compare them. For instance, religion and science both have a high respect for truth, but it's a different truth. For religion, something is true if it fits authority, which might be the Bible or the Quran, or if you're a political religious person, it might be the works of Marx. You test things against authority or what the priest says, and then it's true. Whereas for science, it's testing it by doing experiments and testing. So the truth is very important, but it isn't so important in the same way for magic and religion, I'm sorry, magic and, and art. And um, that means that's because there's a different criteria of belief. When people say to me, yeah, but do you really believe in fairies and magic and all spirits and things? I say, there's a different belief means something different. And people say, why? I mean, surely you just believe or you don't believe. And I say to them this, if you've got a group of people, ordinary people, and you say, do you believe in fairies? Hands up if you believe in fairies. Not many people would put their hands up because not many people have seen fairies or know people who've seen fairies or think fairies are possible. Because um, what they're saying really is fairies haven't proven to me that they believe that they're true. They're not written up in the Bible. The Bible doesn't talk about fairies and science doesn't recognize them. So I can't believe in them. But if I say to the same group of people, do you believe in equal rights for women? A lot of hands would go up. But actually the evidence that women around the world have equal rights is much less than the evidence for fairies. Um, but people believe in it because they're doing something different. What they're really saying is, I'm giving a, a gift of belief to equal rights of women. I'm giving something to that. I'm supporting it, if you like. I'm going with it. And that's a type of belief that works in art and magic. If you go to a Shakespeare play, um, you, uh, you don't have someone like Richard Dawkins saying, stop this, stop this, this is a fraud. These people are only acting, it's, it's not real. It's not good history. You give a gift of belief, you go along with it and you can have an amazing experience. You can learn things, you can learn truths from a Shakespeare play, uh, even though it's not true. It's quite a different thing. You can learn truth from a painting, even though it isn't true in any sense. And there's the same thing with magic. If someone takes a tarot pack and there's ancient wisdom of the Egyptians in these cards, and I'll give you a reading. The skeptic will say, well, that's nonsense. You know, that tarot pack didn't exist before the Middle Ages. You know, it's, it's, it's rubbish. But what the person is doing is giving a gift of belief. Go along with this idea that's got ancient wisdom. And the more you can do that, the better reading you'll get. It's again, like with art, you give this gift of belief. And, it, and so in that sense, I believe in magic, I believe in fairies, all these things, because 
I'm going along with it. It's something that I'm, I'm doing and um, I get results. So that's um, one of the differences. When I say res I get results, there's actually that's another difference between science and magic is how you judge success. In science, you have to make predictions ahead, which are precise and that people can share and agree. And um, the, whereas in magic, you judge the success by looking back subjectively and deciding for yourself if it has worked. And an example of this really is a healing ritual where if there's a group of people and one of them has got cancer or something and they do a healing ritual, now inside themselves, they probably see him, the cancer, but it doesn't usually work like this. Very often something else changes, like the person looks better, but he says, no, no, I'm still going to die in six months time. But my attitude has changed. I'm now going to really live my life for those last six years, those last six months, because before I was always living in fear, I wasn't really living. And what's interesting about that is that um, the people who go along realize that a healing has taken place, though it wasn't quite what they expected. And um, uh, the scientists will say, well, that's nonsense. It's just a change in attitude. You know, nothing has happened really. But that sort of healing can be very powerful. It can affect the whole group of people. It could change their lives, a healing like that. And what is rather fascinating is that sometimes when that happens, the person will actually live longer. Instead of dying after six months, they'll live another three years. And people say, that shows the magic has worked was actually the real magic success was that change that took place. And you can always explain the living longer in scientific terms. Oh, because he was more positive, his, um, his immune system was, was improved and therefore he lived longer. You can explain it away. And people say, ah, oh, but the magic worked. Whereas actually the magic, that change in consciousness was the fundamental change. And the good benefits that came from that are an example of how the world changes if your mind changes, which is very much the way magic works. So when I wrote my first book, SSOTBME, that was the sort of thing I was writing about. And um, I, I was afraid I was writing a theoretical sort of book. So I was very pleased when Gerald Suster reviewed that book and he said, this is the book that's put the magic back in magic. And the reason is that, um, you see, magic had survived the 50s, that very skeptical time, by becoming psychological. Writers like Dion Fortune, Israel Regardi, on the whole treated magic, and, and W.E. Butler, treated magic as a sort of an inner exercise, um, a thing you do in your mind, um, in visualization. And so people, even in the 50s could believe in magic in the sense that it was like a psychological journey you did. It was a form of individuation. Um, and so the idea grew up that magic was really, that's what it was. It's a sort of psychodrama, you know, an inner working. But in Sisopomy, I pointed out how your beliefs about the world, how much actually they affect what happens. And so, um, Gerald said, this is the book that put the magic back in magic. And um, I was very flattered by that. I was very pleased because he saw that was a sort of turning the tables. It was getting back to the idea that thinking is so fundamental. Your view of the world is so fundamental. It actually can cause magical things to happen. And so that was um, very important for the chaos current, which evolved a realization that to change your beliefs and you can change what happens. The world you experience changes. And so, you know, that was an important part of that. So that's really was, um, uh, you know, that was the chaos magic theory, which um, how it fed into it, a realization that it's changing your mind, the way you think actually changes the world around you. And um, 
yeah, it opened up practical math for the genera next generation. Uh, this was before you made the Abramelin. Eh? So my next question yes. is, what is the Abramelin ritual? Uh, why did you decide to mm. perform it? And how was the process? Did it work? And mm. what's the sensation of finding and talking to your holy guardian angel? Yeah. Well, um, I, as I said, I'd, I'd come across this when I was at school and was sure I was going to do it when I grew up. But actually, life isn't like that. And it was only because I'd published that book, SSOTBME, I had a letter one day from a woman who said uh, she wanted to meet me to put forward a proposal. And I arranged to meet her and I went to visit her and she lived quite close by. And she said she wanted to do the Abramelin operation. And would I be her advisor to help her? Now, I was very flattered, of course, but I said, I haven't done it myself. I'm not really in position to be your advisor. Um, you know, I wouldn't bullshit you. And so um, she was so keen. I said, look, let's both do it. I was in a boring job. I could leave it. And if we both did it in our separate lives, but we kept in contact with each other, I could help her by advising her in that way, as I was doing it too. And so that's what happened. I left my job and um, I built the temple, all the things that it says in the book and um, in my garden. And I'd started the operation and she did it in Luton nearby and we kept in touch. Now, um, that was, uh, yes, it, it really, was very challenging for me. Um, I would have liked to have gone to the deep country to do it, you know, to really isolate myself from the world. But of course, that isn't so easy to do nowadays. Um, if I turned up in, the, in a little cottage in the deep country, I attract attention in England. People would come and bring, old women would give me cakes and, and think I was unhappy in love and, and ask me if I, how I was and things like that. You know, it draws attention, a young man turning up in the middle of nowhere. So I just did it where I was living and kept a low profile. And it was, that was really challenging because I was trying to live an ordinary life on the outside, whereas actually I was doing this operation and dedicating my life to it. And, um, it was a very challenging time for me and I learned a great deal. It was a struggle. And um, I, at the end, I didn't think I'd succeeded. And yet something very, very important had happened. And it felt incomplete. And actually the things that should have happened in the last seven days really happened over the next seven years in symbolic form. My life changed immensely and I learned a hell of a lot from it. And um, so it was, it was an extraordinary experience, which I am still learning from. Um, heard from my guardian angel, but not seen it. If things, messages came to me. Um, it's very hard to explain that. And in fact, I've written it up. Uh, there is a book, one of my books, which is about my experience and what I learned doing it, which I, I, I just published um, or was published um, a couple of years ago about uh, my experience of, of the Abram Lynn. Yes, yeah, so I think actually that's the best I could say about it. There's too much to say on that um, and its significance for me. So, and, and explain. Uh, changed your views on magic of that. How did the Abramelin ritual influence you in Thunder's Quick? Yes. Mm. Um, I was, I wrote it the year after. And I had a lot of ideas in my calling for attention. 
um, it was it was almost like a street like I had two people talking in my head against each other um, Angerford and Lee the two people who I put as the authors of it and um, uh, uh, it was really became a very important book for the chaos magicians because I was deeply exploring the nature of reality and, and, and things that happen in that book. Um, and um, yeah, it was a sort of working out of the Abramelin operation in a sense of how it affected me. Um, it's very hard to, um, yeah, so uh, it was very hard to explain that. And so Thunderstreet came out as a sort of a manifestation rather than an explanation of my magic. And what is interesting, the chaos magicians found Thunderstreet told them a lot. It's, it spoke to them. They could resonate with what I was saying in that. Whereas SSOTBME was very much a, a clear sort of intellectual exploration. Thundersqueak was more of a rant. I had the argument between these two people um, and it was um, exploring deeper magic in a way. Some of the things that I wouldn't say I'd learned, but I was still processing after the um, Abramelin operation. Mm. To me, it was a very deeply one. I thought, pardon me, I, I believe that the time, the first time I read it, that you were experiencing on drugs. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have a vision that was so, so open and so full about the reality mm. that thought, uh, he was experiencing LSD or something. <laughs> but it was not grumbling. In a sense, know. I was, yeah. In a sense, I was still high on the Abramelin operation, you know, that ha has it finished? It hasn't finished. You know, something was still churning inside me. So I sat in my garden um, the next year in the sunshine and wrote and wrote and wrote Thunder Squeak. You know, it, it came out like that. Um, yeah. Abramelin. So, okay. oh. <laughs> mm, <laughs> you asked yeah. me a question ahead of about uh, 10 years or more. <laughs> mm, yeah. And in 1987, you wrote about the concept that we live in some sort of virtual reality that was later mm. explored in movies like The Matrix and everything now. Yes, yes. How do you see the development mm. of computer graphics and virtual reality as it is today, in parallel with mm. the development of magic and chaos magic 40 years later? Mm. Because at that time, yeah. we didn't have what mm. we have today. Today, we do have virtual reality. Mm. Yes. Well, um, uh, way back, um, um, I think when was it? Yes, when I was at school, um, there was a guy called Professor George came and talked to us about um, uh, the idea that of we are computer, computer thinking, computer minds, artificial intelligence, and um, the he argued that uh, you know that we would be able to create computers that think like humans and, and, and um, have art in them. And the people I was with were all what we call art students more. You know, they were doing English, um, English, foreign languages, things like that, history. And I was a mathematician. And um, they were protesting about this. They're saying, oh, you know, um, how, could, um, how could a computer um, do something creative, things like that, these questions. And I was thinking rather differently. I thought, this is amazing. Um, if myself is made up of information, um, in a, an information structure, I began to see possibilities rather than limitations in that. If that same information structure was reborn in another mind, I would have reincarnated, you know, um, if that information structure was reborn in a computer, then I could live inside a computer in an art, what we now call a virtual reality. So I saw this as an amazing opening up of ideas, whereas they saw it as a closing down of, of you know, their belief in art and everything like that. And um, if, a, if, a, if a mind is in a machine, then you could put a whole society into a machine. You could have a world 
which was a complete world and people in it would think they were in a real world. That was the sort of thing I was exploring. And um, the first thing I wrote along those lines was in about 1970, when, um, uh, I don't know if you know, Von Daniken was talking about the idea that um, uh, people had come from outer space and had left monuments on the earth and ideas on the earth, which showed that they, we'd been visited by space people. And the problem with that argument was there didn't seem to be any remains, you know, there was no remains of spacecrafts or, or obvious signs that they'd been there. Now, I had this idea that everyone was getting very worried about overpopulation. You know, will the world be able to support a billion, billion people in the future? And I had this idea, well, why don't you make what we'd now call virtual copies of our world, make a million of them, and then download people's minds into those things. And so I wrote a story where this happened. And so in that story, the person who'd invented this idea, he was the last person to be downloaded. And he found he was coming around in a, in a, as a tribal sage. There were lots of young children all around him. And he realized they'd been born into this virtual world. And his world, the real world, was now a myth. It was just something people talked about and soon they would forget about it. And so he thought, gosh, what can I do to leave my mark? And he decided to build great stone monuments with careful geometry in them. And the idea was, of course, that this is the world where Eng had been left as a message from someone, you know, from the real world and we were in the virtual world. And so I wrote that as a story in about 1970. And it wasn't until about 10 years later, um, I returned to that idea um, because people were beginning to look for the, the theory of everything. People like um, Richard, uh, uh, no, uh, Stephen Hawkins was trying to work at the theory, you know, the mathematical equations which lay behind our whole world. Now, I thought to myself, if he found those equations, how would you prove they worked? You couldn't get enough matter to make a universe to prove it worked. The only way to do it would be to model it in a computer and see if you got a big bang, if worlds formed just like ours. Um, that would prove that, you know, this is how the universe is made up. But where would you stop? If you just found, you know, planets forming and suns forming, the religious people say, oh, yeah, but you haven't got any life there. This isn't the real thing. You would have to keep it running and, and keep looking at it until you found a planet where life formed. Then the religious people would say, yeah, but I mean, you know, you've simulated life. But this isn't people. So you'd have to wait until intelligent beings like us evolved. And they'd say, mm, yeah, I, th I, think, I think they're just models you've made, you know, like us. So where could you stop? In fact, there is no stopping point, but the best you could do was to keep running it until people on that planet get the idea, they discover science, they discover what the world is made of, and they too make a, a computer model of their world and do the same thing as we have done. So I said, if um, the world is as the scientists say it is, you know, and it's, it's all based on mathematical things, People would make a model of it, and that would make a model, and that would become a model. Any one real world would produce a cascade of virtual worlds um, following the same pattern. And so it's very unlikely we happen to be in the original one. It's much more likely we're in one of the many which were created, you see. So I was saying, yes, you know, we must be living in a virtual world. Um, and that was what I, I wrote up in, in about 1980. Um, I was writing that up. And then um, in about 1986, I got round to writing a book about it. And by then I decided, well, you know, um, uh, it isn't so much whether we are in a virtual world or not, it's whether we think we are. If people start to discover virtual reality and it gets better and better and better, um, how would they believe there's two types of reality? You can't tell the difference. You know, it's like what happens with um, religion. If people believe in God and God made the world, 
and scientists show that it could happen without God, then the mind finds it difficult to think, oh yes, there's real worlds and then there's the world that God made. They would say, we don't need God. Um, it's just the world that the scientists describe. Now, I said the same thing would happen if we start experiencing really vivid virtual realities. Why should we think there are real realities and virtual realities you can't tell the difference? Everything must be a virtual reality. So that was the sort of the line I was taking then. And um, then I discussed how they might arise out of nowhere, these virtual realities, in the same way life evolved out of chemicals and like that. Maybe information processes could just develop virtual realities. And so that was the sort of um, thinking I developed. And I wrote it up as this book called Words Made Flesh. And when I first wrote it, we didn't have the term virtual reality. So I wrote about uh, uh, mathemat you know, computer models of the universe. And it was when I republished it in 1990, uh, no, in 2000, I called it um, uh, virtual, I put virtual reality in the sub term for it. And of course, with the matrix and all that in the 90s, um, the idea was much more. So in a way, it was a book which was very much ahead of its time, um, but a bit dated for that, you know, because I spend a lot of time arguing that that um, in a computer, original ideas can manifest, you know, um, it can be creative in a way which we now take for granted with artificial intelligence. So in that way, it's, it's a sort of outdated book, but it still goes further than the current debates because I explore what difference would it make to our perception of the world if we start to think that we're living in, a, um, in an information universe. You know, and what difference does it make to our views of magic and our views of religion and things like that? So it still explores further than, um, than you know, a lot of the discussion, which is still ex extant about virtual reality. So that, that is the value of the book, I think. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, it's an interesting idea because, you see, there's this idea that behind our world there is a spirit world and what I provided was a very interesting model of that because if you're on a playing a computer game you're in this you know a 3d world and you're running around doing things but behind it there's all this software which you don't see it's like another dimension you know it's not there and this is very analogous to the idea of a spiritual world you know here am I here are my hands, I'm doing things, um, I'm born, I'm created, but the spirit world is a sort of another dimension behind it all, which is making things happen, which has created me. Well, that's very analogous to the idea that um, we're in this 3D game, if you like, um, but the reality behind it is software which is running all the time and we don't see it we don't all we can see is what it manifests so it's a very suggestive idea and very interesting for magicians i think because um uh, the the chaos magicians created a form of magic called cyber magic where you're really taking this worldview and you're trying to get up into the high level software higher level software in order to bring about changes and um it's a it's, very, it's a very suggestive analogy that I think, and um, I think it's a lot more work can be done on cyber magic and this idea of we're living in a virtual reality. That, that brings me to uh, the next question, because if words can change reality, how do you see this post-truth, <laughs> fake news, media manipulative battle that we are exposed in social media? Because everyone is just trying <laughs> to manipulate the words with words, so mm. your you, you words, yes. words made flash. Now you got words made Facebook, and whoever mm. tells the better story convinces everyone, and the reality is that. And you have bubbles. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Well, um, I see this as one of the examples of we're moving. Um, I have this idea of cycles, which I describe in SSOTB and me, that instead of the linear thing going up and we reach the final point, which is scientific thinking, I point out that actually 
magical thinking comes after scientific thinking. And I've already given that example, you know, that the Roman era was a time of magical thinking, whereas the earlier classical era was a time of scientific thinking. And I've seen this in my own life, you know, that um, the 50s, I say, was a very uh, sort of down to earth scientific view of the world. Science had all the answers, but it was followed by the 60s and a magical revival. The same thing happened in Victoria times. So I was arguing that actually magical thinking follows on from scientific thinking um, and it's more sophisticated in many ways. And um, I justified that. Now, um, I think that is what is happening now. The world is moving more towards magical thinking, but it hasn't learnt how to go with magical thinking. So for instance, um, Max Harris has got a very interesting podcast called, um, uh, oh, what's it called? He discusses things like artificial intelligence and, and views of the world and post-truth and things like that. Um, uh, he was very concerned about this post truth and what Trump saying, things like that, saying that we're losing that sense consensus view of the world. We need a solid all agree on. Okay, see, there was this big concern that if we don't have a unifying sort of um, uh, consensus reality, then the world will fall apart. This is what Max Harris is very concerned about and some of the people who spoke with him. Now, I realized that um, a chaos magic exercise which Pete Carroll described is you try out different beliefs and he said you know have have a dice and have six different belief systems one might be the scientific reality another might be the view of the world another might be the theosophist view another might be the Islamic view or the Buddhist view and you throw the dice and for a week a month or whatever you live that reality and you see how they work now, so that um, this is like the games layer I talked about um, of chaos magic. Um, the Platonists have a sort of truth layer. What is the truth behind this universe? You know, the scientists say the truth is it's a material world and you can discover everything by studying the material world. The Christians say, or the Protestants say, it's all in the Bible. If you just study the Bible, you can discover the truth about the world and so on. There are many different truths. And I said that mag magicians have a games layer, which they realize, well, you could choose which truth you want to live for the time being. Um, you know, and um, it's like playing a game. Okay, today I'm going to believe in astrology. Tomorrow I'm going to believe in the Yi King, um, different systems. And um, it doesn't matter that they don't agree. In that sort, I don't need this consensus reality. It doesn't worry me that um, uh, the different people believe different things, I can sort of surf between these different beliefs. Now, um, but people are very worried about it. They say, uh, like, do you remember that um, there's a, a movie on, Net on Netflix called uh, The Social Dilemma about how we can be manipulated by social media. People find out the patterns of our thought and then they can make us do certain things. Well, um, that doesn't work very well for me. I have all these adverts appear now. I ought to be a really good candidate for um, you know, advertising because I've been on the internet for ever since it began, you know, and I, and I do a lot of internet shopping. It's as though they're getting it very wrong. And I think it's partly because as a chaos magician, I I'm not locked into um, these various different uh, labels that we have. And this is one of the things I learned from the Abramelin operation. It was like a peeling away of the things, my beliefs about myself was an important part of it. And I gave the example, you see, okay, I'm British. Now for a lot of people, that's a lot of what I am. I'm, I'm a very British person, but I'm living in South Africa. And if I change my nationality, would I stop being me? No, I wouldn't. Um, I'm educated. But what if I hadn't got that scholarship and I hadn't gone to Cambridge? Would I not be me? 
no, I'd still be me. And it's, it's like all these labels that people use to define themselves and society gives us to define us. You realize you can detach from them. I used to call it peeling off when I did the Aberlin operation, but actually it's, it's, I'm still British, I'm still educated, but it's like I'm not attached to that. Now, a lot of this politics is about manipulating those labels. Um, if I was talking to, it was a crowd and the supporters there, and there were a lot of um, br uh, people from Harvard and Yale, I might say something like, well, as any educated person knows, blah, 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 blah. And that saying that, I've got all this Harvard and Yale people listening, and the Trump people not listening. It, people, politicians use these sort of labels to manipulate us. But if you've gone through this exercise of detaching from all those labels, they can't use them to control you in the same way. People are quite frightened of this exercise because so what's important to them, and so they can be manipulated by politicians. Okay, so if you detach from these labels, um, you're less easy to be manipulated politically. And people are a bit frightened. They think, if I, but I take off these labels, there might be nothing left. But what is interesting is the nothing that's left is enormous. It is actually your common humanity, something you share with everyone. And, you know, and, and it, it's very hard to reach it, but it actually, at the end, it's a very big thing. And it links you to other people. So um, that was one of the things of doing the Abra Malin that I learned. And so on this question of you know, post-truth, are we being manipulated? The answer is we, we have to learn how to think magically, how to work magically, rather than rejecting it as, as a stupid thing from the past. Because for example, um, the important question, the, with religion and science, I said, are very much addicted to truth. You must know what is true, otherwise it is nothing. But actually, there are many half-truths. And I give that example of art. You know, a Shakespeare play, as history, can be completely untrue, and yet it contains great truths about humanity. Um, so, in the same way, uh, for magic, it isn't it's whether it's true; it's whether it works that's important. It doesn't matter. You can't don't have to prove to people that the tarot pack is based on Egyptian wisdom. You just have to see if that idea works and if it gives you good readings and so on. And so um, the question you should ask if Trump says someone or some politician says something which um, you don't believe in is not to, to rush to find out whether it is true, because that really is a bit of a dead end. You know, people get so worried about what Trump is isn't true. Instead, you say, what, why is he saying that? What is the reason he's saying that? And I gave an example of that um, magical thing is uh, what symbols and their thinking. Um, it's different from a logical argument. And I gave the example of Guinness advert. Guinness is good for you. Now, you could get very worried about that and you could try to test whether it really is good for you. A thousand people, give them Guinness, who gets better and all that. But instead you say, why are they saying that? And you realize it's a good advertising slogan. Um, taste of Guinness is a bit medicinal. You can feel good drinking it. Um, yes, you could say it's good for me in reasonable quantities. And it isn't about the truth. It's about its effectiveness. And so, if a politician says something like, you know, Britain would be better if it left the European Union, um, game, uh, could say, let's try this game. Um, the town I'm in is very run down. It's full of immigrants that I can't speak to. Let's, let's try it. And so you vote for going out with a lot of other people. 
But you see, a lot of people vote for that because they think it's true that we'll be better when we go out. But if you've just voted to try it as a magical experiment, you don't vote for that again. You vote against it and you give a different government. And what's interesting there is you have kept your power. If you voted because you thought it was true, um, say you voted for Trump because you believed him. Now, if his, his, um, if his policies don't work, believe in him, you're likely to think they didn't work because nasty people, Democrats, sabotaged him. That's why it didn't work. And you go on believing and you get more and more hooked on believing in Trump. As if you just said, oh, I'm going to try Trump. Um, his ideas might help me. And if your town gets better, oh, that look, it, it's, he's right. You know, um, uh, manufacturing is improved again, you know. But if you decide that um, it's not doing much good to America, then you say, yeah, it worked a bit, but it isn't really working in the global stage. So I'm going to drop that belief. You're thinking magically. You're trying testing something to see if it works rather than because you believe it is true, which is you could get very trapped in that belief that something is true because once you've committed yourself, you want to go on believing it's true. So that's part of my remedy. And I wrote it up in um, you know, a, a little book on thoughts on post-truth and politics. It's that um, firstly, uh, learn to live without a consensus reality by seeing what works for you, what works best, like believing in tarot packs, believing in fairies or whatever. It doesn't mean you found the truth and you must tell everyone. It's just that this works for me. And the other thing is, um, if someone in a position of power is making statements, you don't have to spend too much time worrying whether they're true or not. The more important thing is to work out why they're saying them, what they're trying to pull over on you. And they're, in, in fact, they're inviting you to a game, a falsehood which they're offering you, and you can decide if it'll work for you or if not. And people have to learn that sort of more detached way of listening to politicians. Because if you um, vote for them on those lines, they are the ones who have to produce results. If I voted for Brexit because I wanted to see if it worked, and it doesn't work, they have to do something to prove that it was the right thing. Whereas if it doesn't work and you, you did it because you thought it was true, all they have to do is to say, oh, the reason it didn't work is the Remainers sabotage it all, or the European Union is sabotaging it. They explain it away, other things. But if you did it only to see if it worked, they have to produce results. You've got the power now. They are the ones who have to produce results if they're going to get their vote again. So that's um, really, um, yeah, that's, that's my thought about it. And I find that with that sort of chaos magic thinking, the ads in YouTube and that, they just don't work for me. Um, very good, occasionally one hits the point and I want to answer it, yes, but uh, I don't find that um, it predicts me very well. I'm a freer spirit. Um, through being a chaos magician. After, uh, after 40 yes, years, so, what is magic to you now? It's very much uh, a, a way of looking at the world, a way of living. I, I, I spoke recently about, um, slightly tongue in cheek, I said, you know, there's two reasons people do magic. One is to make life less interesting. The other is to make life more interesting. And I said, that sounds crazy because who'd want to make life less interesting? And then I quoted, you know, there's an ancient Chinese proverb that, um, oh no, ancient Chinese curse, which is, may you be reborn into interesting times. Well, um, the idea being that interesting times are pretty painful. And in that sense, I think people very often go into magic because they don't like what's happening, you know, they're unhappy in their work, they haven't got enough money, um, or their girlfriend or boyfriend has just rejected them. 
And so they look for magic to solve that. And I say, in a way, they're wanting to make life less interesting because they're wanting to control it. So it does what they want. And that's a very strong impulse for doing magic, to try to make, um, <clears throat> to change the world in conformity with your will. But there is another side to magic, which is, and very often it's people who've done magic for longer, they realize actually, if you can just make the world you want to control it, you're in a sense become trapped inside yourself. And you see this with, pol with um, dictators who have absolute power. They tend to go crazy because they have got the power to make the world exactly how they want it. Build castles, um, kill people you don't like. And they tend not to be happy people because in a way, they are now res totally responsible for the world they're living in and they don't like it. It hasn't worked, which is a terrible discovery. Whereas someone who goes along with what happens, life is constantly throwing up challenges. It's a constant, in a live way, life is more interesting. And magic can be like that. Um, I did the Abramelin operation sort of I had to admit, I was hoping for the powers that come at the end of the book. But actually what I found was life was much richer. Um, it was much more, in, I was interacting with the world much more. It's like a conversation where I'm always learning new things. And that's a beautiful thing. And so I'm one of those people who does magic to make life more interesting, not to make it less interesting. And so, yeah, that's what magic is for me now. It's a very explore. I have to ask you this. Since I have interviewed several religions, leaders, and philosophers, I must ask you also, mm. what is your opinion? Mm. In your opinion, what happens to us after we die? I don't know. Um, I told you about Gerald York, the, the um, Crowley disciple who, um, you know, I learned a lot about Crowley from him. Um, uh, he became a Buddhist uh, when I knew him. He was head of the Buddhist Institute in, in, in England, Buddhist society. And his last word, I was told, was, now for the great adventure. In other words, he in a sense was looking forward to finding the answer to this question which people live with all their lives. And I feel something like that. Um, but... Um, what do I believe? Remember that I said in magically, a belief is a gift you give to something. Well, the gift I give is to reincarnation. It's like what I need to believe in. Very interesting in Jung, in his um, uh, pseudo autobiography, Memories, Dreams and Reflections. Towards the end of his life, he had a dream which looked like real proof of the afterlife. He woke up. Uh, in his dream, and he went next door, and there was a. And when he went, I think the next day, he looked, and that book was something like The Dead Do Return or something like that. So, for many people, that proves the afterlife. This dream has shown that it's real. But what was interesting to me is Jung didn't say, Now I know there is an afterlife. What he said is, Clearly, my mind needs to believe in an afterlife. So it's rather like the magical belief. He says, I'm now going to accept that, that my mind needs to believe in an afterlife. And I think that my mind needs to believe in reincarnation. Um, it does seem ridiculous, you know, that someone could be born handicapped and die at the age of one, not having had experience. It does seem ridiculous that some people's lives seem to be so hard and other people's lives are so spoiled. and I can only really accept that um, for myself in terms of there will be another after another life and you will learn, a, you'll become a complete human by going through the different experiences of poverty, riches, um, health, sickness, all the different human experiences. You know. So um, I would say I believe in reincarnation in the magical sense of I give the gift of belief to reincarnation. It's what I need. This has been a, a great alchemy talk. You, you turned everything into golds today. 
I have just one last question. That is what mm. counsels uh, you would give to someone that's entering the magical world now? Gosh, it's sort of like the one word thing, I would say is keep exploring. Um, this is new territory. Um, another thing is, is keep challenging your beliefs. Um, it's very easy for people to say, discover, I don't know, um, say a new age idea. And they say, this is the truth. And realize that actually magical growth doesn't come through the truth so much as what works. And rather than go around to your friends and saying, I've discovered the truth, I discover the truth. Say, I found something that works. Now, if you've got something that also works for you, let me explore if it works for me. It's, it's, it's exploring to find what works. I'd say that's a very important part of magical exploration. Um, try different things. Try believing something different for a day. You know, become a, uh, become a fundamentalist Christian for a day or two and see how the world looks different from that standpoint. And if you can't imagine that you're a fundamentalist Christian for a day or two, you're not a very good magician. You should be able to step into any reality um, and explore it and see how it works. Um, so, yeah, does that work? <laughs> Greatly. Hmm. Uh, so where can we find more about you? Do you have a blog, a website, channel? And, and everything you say will be down here in the description hmm. of this video. Oh, yes. Well, um, I do have a website, uh, which I can give you the link to. It's not a very in it. It's, it's got my videos listed in it, but I haven't been putting material in it. So um, but I think my YouTube channel is a better link. Um, I'll give you a link to my YouTube channel where I speak as Ramsey Jukes. And I don't know, there must be more than 50 um, videos in there of me saying my ideas. And then, of course, there are my books. And the book which sells best and people find most helpful is SSOTBME, an essay on magic. And I can give you the link to that. And that is the book that I wrote initially in the 1970s, um, where I first, that book I talked about, is where I first expressed my ideas. Now, there is a, um, uh, a more recent book where I try to enlarge on that and write not just for magicians, but for a general audience. And I called it My Years of Magical Thinking, which really expands on that. And... Um, uh, but it hasn't got the brevity and wit of SSOT BME. It's a more ponderous book, but I try to be very complete in my exegesis in that book. The, we talked about the virtual reality idea. There's a book called Words Made Flesh, where I really talk about that. And it's, it's a bit out of date now, because when I wrote in the mid uh, 70s, no, mid 80s, um, uh, AI and things were very much sort of up in the air. So it, it's, it was ahead of its time and yet dated in many ways. But it's, it still has interesting arguments in it. Um, and then there's a book called The Good, the Bad and the Funny, which is a quaint book. It's sort of like an alchemy book. Um, and it's exploring the idea of Trinitarian as opposed to dualistic thinking. Now, a lot of our thinking is like good, bad, God, devil, um, true, false, science, religion, you know, polarized thinking like that. And I say, if we thought in threes, God, devil, trickster, um, good, bad, funny, um, then it might free up our thinking. And so that's a real ex exploration of how the world can change if you start practicing thinking in threes. So that's an interesting book. It's a bit different. Those are ones all I published. And I also published some essays, but they're probably better, you know, if you've read the main books and you can follow up with the essays. But I've also had published by some, a little book of demons, where I look at um, 
yeah, I look at the sort of the demons in our mind and how you can make a pact with them. Um, how uh, we're very limited in our thinking by certain fears, beliefs, bring different ways of looking at the world, which is an interesting one, the little book of demons. And the other one, which someone has asked about, is um, how to see fairies. And that was based on a, um, an online course I did where um, you can explore the world through learning how to speak to fairies or nature spirits or whatever you like to call them. And so I take the reader through a series of exercises, assuming that you begin a bit skeptical. And so I gradually sort of um, work, it's a practical book, work through the objections um, to open you up to this broader way of thinking so that you can experiment. And in the end, you can begin to see fairies and work with them. That's how it's, it's meant to be. And it's quite an interesting practical book, which um, uh, is based on that. Hmm. And uh, let me think, um, I've, a book that I'm working on now, which uh, I said I would publish in um, 1992, no, 1992, that's it. And it's, it's only just going to come out next year, I should think, um, is for a long time, I wrote a, a satirical column called The Satanist Diary, where I played the role of this evil magician. Um, and I've got this whole lot of characters um, and it's playing with um, uh, current affairs from this sort of Satanist viewpoint. And people found it was very funny, and they always asked me to publish it. Well, I'm trying to do that now. I'm I'm busy with my um, with my Quark Express laying it out and everything. Yeah, um, and that's by the honourable honourable Hugo C. Sinjin Lestrange, which is another pseudonym, if you like. <laughs> and, I have a question from Breno. He said, "What was uh, your experience with the IoT and the OTO?" Oh yes. Well, the trouble with the OTO for me is, is it's very formal um, and I'm not a very formal person. So I've sort of moved up the, the, I did the initiations, which worked very well for me up to a certain point. And then um, I, I lost track. Um, I can't remember, it's sort of seventh degree or something. Um, I represent the OTO in, in South Africa um, but my heart isn't in it quite so much. Um, it's a, it's a, the formality doesn't suit me. And so that way, I'm much more of a chaos magician. Of our respect, you know, that some people get a lot out of the OTO and its formality. And I very much respect Crowley and his ideas. Now, the IoT, um, I never moved up that hierarchy. Uh, my spirit is much more in the chaos magic. Um, it's much more in line with chaos magic. And but I never really needed to be in a formal group. Um, I just kept exploring my own up by the chaos magic fraternity. They fit very well. But um, say I did at the first level, but I didn't, I didn't do more. I went my own path. So, yes, I uh, I think of the two, um, I was never very much deeply into the IoT, but it is more closer to my way of thinking. I kept up. Okay. That's okay. Uh, uh, so I was just going to say, talking about the, comparing the two. It was great. I would just say goodbye to the people in the YouTube, and then I will open our vision. We will ask some more questions to you. Well, thank you so much mm. for your time. It, it was one of the greatest interviews I had. Uh, I'm very thrilled. And for me, it was an, a very... <laughs> Great honor, sir. Thank you so much for having us for oh. this conversation. 
It's wonderful you say that because I was afraid with all the breaks and everything that I might have been a bit incoherent. So I, I hope I gave value and it was um, the fragments add up to something. And thank you for the honor of joining you. We had a lot of other viewers, listeners in Brazil. Uh, it's not everybody that speaks English. So we have to, to mm. put subtitles and everything down. There were a lot of people mm. who really want to listen to you. They will do that later mm. in YouTube with the subtitles, but oh, yes. thank you so mm. much. And I, I will just say mm. something important and then we will talk later. E para vocês que acompanharam a gente até agora, não esquece, segue o canal, dá like e dá uma olhada, porque essa foi a, a entrevista número 120, então a gente tem muita entrevista para trás. Segue o canal e a gente se vê aí no próximo Bate-Papo Mayhem. <música>